Good evening, everyone. Welcome to NAMI Finger Lakes Family Forum. Thank you for joining us for tonight's program. We hope our recent family forums have been informative for understanding mental health crisis response in Tompkins County, and that this program can help us reimagine public safety in our community. Tonight, we are delighted to welcome a representative from White Bird Clinic's CAHOOTS program, crisis assistance helping out on the streets. CAHOOTS is a community-based public safety system for responding to people in crisis in Eugene, Oregon. Family Forum is a monthly program NAMI Finger Lakes has provided in cooperation with Tompkins County Mental Health for over a decade. The fourth Tuesday of each month, we offer presentations and discussions on topics of interest to the mental health community, which is all of us, isn't it? This event is being recorded and will be available on the NAMI Finger Lakes YouTube channel soon, where you can also find our previous events and discussions on crisis response in Tompkins County. NAMI Finger Lakes is your local affiliate of the National Alliance on Mental Illness, the largest grassroots mental health organization providing support, education, and advocacy for the millions of Americans affected by mental health conditions. Locally, NAMI provides a helpline, support groups, and educational programs for families navigating mental illness. All of our services are free. We often hear that NAMI is the best kept secret for mental health resources in our area. We don't want to be a secret, so please share our information with people that you care about. To learn more, you can visit our website at namifingerlakes.org. After tonight's presentation, we'll have an opportunity for questions. Please hold your questions until that time, and in the interest of time, so we can get to as many as possible, please submit your questions using the chat. So let's dive right into tonight's program. We'd like to welcome Tim Black with White Bird Clinic which runs the CAHOOTS program. Tim Black is the Director of Consulting at White Bird Clinic with a background in runaway and homeless youth, harm reduction and street outreach. Tim began working for CAHOOTS as a crisis intervention worker in 2010 before moving into an administrative role as the CAHOOTS operations coordinator. In addition to his work with White Bird Clinic, Tim also serves on the board of directors for Eugene's community supported shelters. Tim, welcome and thank you for being with us. Thank you. It's, uh, I'm happy to be here, uh, you know, remotely with you all um, and really just like to take a moment to recognize that you all have chosen to take some time out of your Tuesday evening to, um, you know, learn about more about this work that we are doing here in, in Eugene. And uh, my hope is that through this conversation, we can um, really, um, help you all further uh, your own dialogues around uh, what it would mean to really kind of bring mobile crisis services, uh, you know, into, um, into your area. Uh, so just, just really excited about this call. Thank you. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen with your slides and Perfect. you can just take the floor and uh, tell us all about you and cahoots and um, just let me know when to advance the slides. Sounds great. Uh, so um, the first thing that we really like to establish with, uh, you know, these types of conversations is that um, uh, CAHOOTS is an acronym. Uh, it stands for Crisis Assistance Helping Out on the Streets. Um, and we've, you know, we've been serving our community uh, with this formalized mobile crisis response uh, since 1989. Um, you can go to the next slide. As one program of White Bird Clinic, um, yeah, perfect. Um, we are employing the same underlying uh, philosophies and values that, that guide the rest of our agency. Uh, White Bird Clinic was started in uh, the winter of 1969, 1970 in response to what we perceive to be largely unmet needs in our community. Um, we, we saw that a lot of systems that were providing care uh, we're, we're providing care in settings that oftentimes left folks in worse shape uh, when they got out of, of that facility as then they went in. Uh, you know, specifically, we would see a, we were seeing a lot of young people who were um, entering the emergency room um, for either medical conditions related to addiction or for mental health that were um, really being treated with Thorazine and then being discharged out to the streets uh, in, you know, with tremors and, and seizures. And, uh, you know, like I said, just generally being in worse shape than they went in. Uh, so 
you know, that really reinforced that there needed to be more client centered services in our community, that, that there need, there was a need for a, a different way of, of responding to the, the mental health, the substance use, uh, the poverty that, that was going on in our community. Um, and, and that the summer of love, uh, you know, 1969 really, uh, helped kind of create the, the kind of social shift that we needed to be able to provide these services. Uh, through, throughout our, our tenure, the last 50 years, everything that Wiper Clinic has done is, is, has really maintained these four tenets of, of being client-centered. Uh, and that's really you know, prioritizing the patient and, and really recognizing uh, them as, as a whole individual. Um, we utilize harm reduction uh, in our, our service delivery, which means that uh, you know whether it's it's related to substance use or other maladaptive coping skills that um, you know we're trying to lessen the impact and and that we are that we recognize that recovery is not a linear process um, and and that recovery means different things for different people and so um, you know through all of our different services uh, that we provide at wiper clinic harm reduction is going to be front and center alongside that is a recognition of how trauma um, impacts our interactions with each other, uh, how we perceive and interact with our environment, um, and and how how we are able to receive different types of care. And so, uh, you know, one of the other guiding uh, philosophies and values for Wiper Clinic service is not just cahoots, is to be trauma informed. And so that that means that. Uh, we, we need to be able to provide services in a way that are able to meet people where they're at on, on a lot of different levels uh, that, um, you know, our, our facilities, when, when somebody's accessing direct in-person resources uh, from, from Wiper Clinic, that uh, those facilities are designed in a way that's easy to navigate, that, that folks, um, you know, can, can enter without that sense of overwhelm uh, and, and really, you know, understand that if we can lessen some of the environmental components of, of somebody's trauma experience, it becomes a a lot easier for us to then work with that individual and focus on, um, you know, the, the underlying issues and uh, provide just a, a more supportive space. And finally, the other thing that really sets Wiper Clinic apart and what really forces us to be human-centered, to employ harm reduction and be trauma-informed um, is that we are a consensus-based collective. That means that uh, our, our day-to-day operations function a little bit differently than, than other organizations. And within that, I have to, uh, you know, as a member of that collective, I have to be human-centered when I'm talking to my coworkers, I have to use harm reduction and be trauma informed in, in those interactions. And by practicing those skills and every component of our, our business operations, uh, it becomes that much easier for us to then apply those skills directly with, um, you know, with our patients out in the community. Uh, and so we can go to the next slide. Um, the, the origins of the CAHOOTS response were called some, were something called the, the Bummer Squad. Uh, when our, our organization first started providing services in 1970, um, we had a crisis line that folks could call. And um, as soon as that crisis line started ringing, before we even had a brick and mortar location, it was just ringing to our founder's house. Uh, we saw that there was a real need for there to be community-based uh, crisis response teams. We didn't have funding. We didn't have a, a formal structure for it. And so when we had extra volunteers on our phone tree that could go out and respond to these calls coming in through our crisis line, you know, we would send a team of two folks out with a uh, with a brown bag of first aid supplies, and they would go out in their personal vehicles, and we would respond to those calls through our wiper crisis, wiper clinic crisis line. Um, and uh, while we were providing that that bummer squad uh, resource of the form of that volunteer crisis teams, public safety and the city of Eugene were really starting to understand how wiper clinic had a role to play in upcoming community policing initiatives um, that, you know, as, as one of the tenets of community policing, engaging with, you know, grassroots organizations and, and, and partners in, in social services, uh, Wiper Clinic time and time again was becoming a resource that law enforcement trusted as a resource to bring folks instead of the hospital for crisis situations. Uh, that the fire department and EMS uh, was finding opportunities to refer folks out to the um, healthcare for the homeless program that eventually became our medical clinic. Uh, there were a lot of these different ways where Wiper Clinic was getting plugged into other uh, public oriented services. And so when it came time to really look at how public safety could benefit from more of these interactions with other with social services, the idea for the CAHOOTS program was born. Um, whether it was the idea of Wiper Clinic staff or City of Eugene staff is really up to up for debate depending on who you talk to that was at those conversations in the 80s. Uh, but ultimately what came out of that was the, the formalization of the CAHOOTS program, uh, which gave us uh, police radios uh, to use for our dispatch, uh, 
uh, city owned vehicles for driving uh, to our responses and, and really um, has, has been how we've been able to, to really continue to grow this program. For the entire 31 and a half years that we've been providing the service in our community, we have always maintained that arm's distance relationship between uh, cahoots as provided by Whitebird Clinic and the city of Eugene. So rather than incorporate this into the Department of Public Health or Public Safety, um, through and through city government and leadership within law enforcement has really reinforced that um, the success of this program and the trust that we appreciate from our community is is really built on the fact that this is Whitebird Clinic providing the service to the community of Eugene and Springfield. Um, today, our teams are always staffed with a uh, crisis intervention worker and an EMT. Um, so anytime that you see one of our vans uh, driving around, whether it's on you know, uh, a news clip on TV or if you're here in, here in Eugene in Springfield, seeing our vans driving around, there's always going to be a two-person team. Um, the backgrounds for our responders are going to be uh, undergraduate level education and experience. Uh, so that's a mental health associate or an EMT basic. Regardless of what kind of a background you come to us with, Everybody who's getting trained to be a responder for the CAHOOTS program is going to go through 500 hours of field training uh, that's supported with a mentor and follows a, a tiered process. There are four phases. Um, we front load that 500 hours of field training with 30 hours in the classroom where we're really providing you with a lot of those initial skills and, uh, you know, really kind of giving you that foundation and then your field training is really about applying those skills from the classroom with the support of uh, a two-person team that's allowing you to really kind of come in incrementally. Um, our teams are all unarmed, so no pepper spray, no tasers, no bulletproof vests. Uh, we rely on verbal de-escalation uh, as our, our key skill for keeping our staff safe and I'll go into a little bit more detail on this later on, uh, but I really want to emphasize early on that um, you know we're able to respond to a significant con portion of the calls that are coming in through our public safety system. And we've never had a staff member injured as a result of patient contact. And, you know, in the 31 years that we've been doing this, um, in addition to our work in verbal de-escalation, one of the other things that really helps us maintain a safe program that is voluntary in nature uh, is that we have an emphasis on support and stabilization in the field, um, providing the least intervention necessary. And that means that we aren't really going to, we're not focusing on long-term outcomes. We're really trying to work with what's going on immediately and recognize that in our role as first responders, uh, you know, we need to, our obligation is to um, de-escalate and, and really gain that trust, uh, you know, of the person in crisis so that we can work with them to find support and stability. Um, and we can go on to the next slide. One of the other things that is really important to address right up front is how this program is funded. Uh, we cover a metro area of about 230,000 folks. That's Eugene Springfield here in Oregon. Um, and the cost of our, our services for that metro area comes out to about $2.2 million a year. Um, and that's for 60 service hours per day with 24 seven coverage. And what that 60 service hours per day means is that uh, we have two vans that are, are operating um, overnight. And then we have a third van that comes in to service so that we have three units responding to call simultaneously during our, our busiest hours during the day. Um, we are separated by uh, the jurisdictions of the law enforcement agencies with when, which we work. So in Eugene, all of our services are funded entirely by the city, uh, which means that we operate within city limits. Um, in Springfield, and the next slide has some breakdown of this budget, but in the city of Springfield, uh, because we're receiving a combination of city and state funds administered by the county, uh, we actually operate within the urban growth boundary, which has helped us really get into some very impoverished rural areas uh, and um, has, has allowed us to just really kind of do, do extended outreach, you know, not just to those communities, but start to engage with our sheriff's department uh, at the county level and start to look at how um, there's some really early conversations now going on around how we can take what we're doing in our metro area and expand it to our county, uh, which, which covers a, a pretty wide swath of territory here. Um, so we'll move on to the next slide and I'll, I'll show you all the breakdown of how our budget works. Um, so uh, in last fiscal year, um, total cost of, operations that based on revenue was uh, $2.2 million. Uh, we received 850,000 of that from the cities of Eugene and Springfield, another 830,000 from Lane County Health and Human Services in the form of a state grant for mobile crisis programming. Um, and I'm gonna pause right here. Um, when we, we started to receive this county funding through this grant, uh, this was what allowed us to start operating in Springfield. Um, and what was really interesting is that with the initial RFP um, to that, that came out to, you know, say if you're an organization that's interested in providing the service, 
you know, let us know. Uh, the intention was to fund more traditional mobile crisis teams where it might be a co-responder assigned to a patrol officer or um, having a couple of clinicians that were being referred out by a crisis line and maybe going out hours later or days later. Um, we had to really say, hey, we know this is different, but you know, we promise we can show some really good results if you fund the CAHOOTS approach uh, to mobile crisis. And they, they were thrown off by the price tag and questions around the logistics of working with law enforcement. Um, but within the first year of, of funding that we received through this grant, we were able to hit the entire state's benchmarks for patient contacts. Uh, and now, uh, you know, five, six years later, um, the Oregon Health Authority is, is putting up the CAHOOTS model of mobile crisis intervention as best practices and encouraging communities to pursue our model, you know, here within the state of Oregon as they receive funding. Um, with that recognition, we've also um, really come to the attention of our local Medicaid providers. Um, and so our, our Medicaid um, insurers here in Lane County contribute a wraparound service payment every month to the tune of $46,000 a year um, to recognize the cost savings that they experience through our diversions from the emergency room or just from ambulance rides and for our ability to really be out there addressing social determinants of health. Uh, you know, CAHOOTS teams can really help address things like uh, mistrust of public institutions, um, you know, how, how poverty relates to inability to access healthcare. Uh, these are areas where CAHOOTS comes in uh, and through our crisis responses, we're able to really save a lot of money for Medicaid. Uh, and then finally, um, it's a big chunk of our pie, but every year uh, CAHOOTS and Whiteboard Clinic do need to engage in some pretty thorough fundraising and, um, you know, work with donors to, to really shore up our resources. A lot of our, our revenue from donations uh, goes right back out into the community in the form of tents, sleeping bags, the things that our, our patients who are most vulnerable really need to uh, just survive the winter out in the elements here in Oregon, uh, but also making sure that we can address basic needs like food, water, hygiene, uh, so that we can really have that opportunity to deescalate a lot of uh, a lot of the situations that we see by just making sure that somebody has adequate access to, to those basic human needs. Um, in addition to the revenue that CAHOOTS receives, there's another probably two hundred fifty to $300,000 that are spent by the cities of Eugene and Springfield uh, to cover our use of publicly owned fleet vehicles uh, and using uh, the uh, police station, you know, the non-emergency public safety number as our dispatch. Um, and so we can, and we can move on to the next slide from here. Um, through that use of the, the non-emergency dispatch system, uh, CAHOOTS teams are able to respond to a very wide variety of, of calls for service. Uh, we start by outlining our calls for service within the agreements that we have with the cities of Eugene and Springfield. Um, and then that translates into dispatch codes. And that's, that's a conversation for a different audience. But what I really wanted to highlight here were some of the areas where we are able to really come in and make such a big impact uh, in service delivery. Um, crisis counseling, I think, is is, is relatively self-explanatory, but um, when it comes to some other components of our work, like conflict resolution and mediation, um, when, when we're going into, you know, for instance, mediated disagreement between roommates, we have the opportunity to uh, do some prevention of homelessness by really ensuring that folks are able to work through conflicts with roommates and maintain housing. Um, you know, we're able to come in and intervene and start to identify needed resources so that somebody um, who may be experiencing an onset of, of very acute symptoms um, doesn't end up in a situation where they're at odds with their landlord because um, they're, they're not able to get those, those middle of the night supports that they really need to find that support and stability. Um, Grief and loss is another, um, you know, really interesting area where we have had a lot of opportunity to come in uh, with suicide postvention and, and support families, um, you know, but also after um, the deaths of loved ones related to COVID, um, you know, here in our county, we've seen a lot of opportunity to really break that trauma cycle by providing folks an opportunity to start to process that grief, you know, initially. Um, another area where grief and loss becomes really important for us is in uh, our ability to deliver emergency messages. Um, so here in Eugene and Springfield, um, if you have a family member or a loved one who's died in another community, um, when that, that local medical examiner is, is relaying that information to public safety here in Oregon, um, it's a CAHOOTS unit who's going out to let that person know that, um, you know, their aunt or uncle in a different community has passed away. Uh, and, and we have just some really tremendously powerful moments that we find there to really connect with folks. Uh, and, and the feedback that we receive is that, um, you know, they would much rather be hearing that information from 
a trained cahoots representative as opposed to, you know, a patrol officer who may be new to the force and is really worried about all the other things that they're hearing coming in on dispatch that are, you know, criminal in nature or are true emergencies. And so, uh, you know, this, I think, really underscores our ability to um, really, you know, help lift up the other more traditional resources in a public safety system. Um, the last thing that I'll really highlight on this slide, because um, I know I'm sure there are a lot of other questions that are going to come up that I'd like to save some time for at the end, is first aid and non-emergency medical care. This is an area where our, our teams are able to um, really just make big differences. Um, when it comes to our, our impact on other public safety systems, by handling all of these first aid and non-emergency medical calls, we're saving that, that paramedic unit from waking up in the middle of the night, getting into their turnouts, and then driving the ambulance across town just to change a bandage. Uh, you know, we're, we're also able to come into some situations where maybe somebody doesn't feel very comfortable articulating um, their emotional experience. Um, you know, maybe they, they come from a family background where this was just something that was really discouraged, but they also have been experiencing a stomach ache for the last month and a half, you know, which is related to the onset of the symptoms. But for them, they can say, I need the Coots medic to come out and talk to me, take my vitals. I've had an upset stomach for the last six weeks straight, and I don't know what to do about it. And there's not a medical emergency that's requiring a fire department presence, uh, but there is something that's going on, you know, at least uh, presenting as medical in nature. And so that becomes an opportunity for us to build that trust and rapport with that individual um, so they can get to a place where they are comfortable talking with the CUT team about the, the uh, you know, the emotional or, or the behavioral side of, of what it is that they're experiencing. Um, the other area where that first aid and non-emergency medical care becomes really important is for um, folks who are living out on the streets and don't have access to that running water to wash their hands uh, before they change a bandage, um, you know, to, for us to really do some harm reduction work and address the, the uh, physical health implications of substance use. Um, and so, you know, I, again, I recognize that folks are probably going to have a lot of other questions about this slide. So um, we'll, we'll talk more about that at the end of the presentation and we can move on to the next slide. Um, we do operate within the uh, public safety dispatch system. Um, this is one of the things that really helps our teams stay safe out in the field. This is our lifeline, uh, you know, back to uh, getting that, that police support when we need it. Um, getting direct contact with the fire department to get an engine out for us or, or an ambulance when we need it for medical emergencies. Um, by being a part of the public safety dispatch system, we're also able to capture a lot of responses that would have otherwise gone to law enforcement if we weren't directly tied into that system. So if folks had to call a separate crisis line number to get a hold of the CAHOOTS teams, you know, there's this whole swath of calls that we wouldn't be receiving from uh, folks who are in need of services and our tourists that are visiting because they came to one of our university's football games or a concert or, you know, maybe somebody just moved to town and they haven't thought to uh, do a Google search for social services before a crisis emerges. Uh, maybe somebody's experiencing something that, um, you know, based on their perception, based on their individual experience, uh, feels like an emergency. And so 911 seems like the only appropriate number to call. Um, so folks can call 911, but we're, non, we're, we're a non-emergency resource. And so we tell them, call the non-emergency line. But regardless of how you access dispatch, all the calls for CAHOOTS service are being triaged the same as every other public safety call. So the call takers in that dispatch center are really looking with every person they're talking to on the phone is this something for the police to handle? Is this something for the fire department or a medic to go out on? Or is it something that CAHOOTS can handle? Um, folks can dial three on the phone tree for the non-emergency dispatch to say, hey, we want CAHOOTS for this. Um, but those, those call takers really have that opportunity to really look at everything that's coming through the system and say, this is most appropriate for that CAHOOTS response. Um, so those calls come in through the public, we call it the public safety answering point, PSAP. Um, calls are triaged by the call takers and dispatchers within that PSAP. And then the CAHOOTS teams who are out in the field responding to calls are being dispatched via the same radio channels as police, just not on the priority station. So just so that we can really allow law enforcement to do what they need to do. We stay off station one, but we're on station two. So we can hear, uh, we can still scan all the other channels. And that means that we can hear everything that law enforcement's doing. Law enforcement hears all the calls that CAHOOTS teams are going out on. And so when we need to call for police cover, which is very infrequent, uh, our, our teams are able to get that support right away. And on the flip side, if we hear officers being dispatched to um, that, that panhandler dancing on a street corner because something fell apart with dispatch and maybe they didn't see that our unit was clear, um, our teams can hop on the radio and say, hey, you know, we just heard an officer being dispatched to this call. It's nothing you know, being reported as criminal. So CAHOOTS can go out. We'll get some eyes on this. We'll check on that. And then we'll let you know whether law enforcement is needed. Um, that really helps us maintain a role as um, 
as even a, you know, a, a resource multiplier. Uh, and so if there's not a, you know, a corresponding reduction in other public safety resources alongside, you know, the implementation of a mobile crisis program like CAHOOTS, inherently we're going to make officers more free to respond to criminal issues. Uh, you know, the firefighters, medics are going to be more available for the heart attacks and the structure fires. Uh, so, you know, we, we really have um, a profound role to play within the other public safety systems to make sure that uh, resources are being utilized appropriately uh, and that uh, whenever possible, we're sending in, uh, you know, the most affordable resource so that we're using tax dollars wisely. Um, you know, the CAHOOTS response costs about $70 an hour and you compare that to two to $300 an hour for response for, uh, for law enforcement and even greater for, uh, for fire departments. Um, the last thing that I'll really emphasize with this slide here is that by being a part of that larger system, um, by being plugged into our non-emergency line as our, our key point of access, um, CAHOOTS is able to handle a profound uh, portion of the calls that are coming into our community. Um, last year in Eugene, there were 105,000 calls for service that came through the PSAP, that, that came through the public safety system, uh, where somebody was experiencing or observing something and called in because there needed to be some sort of response. So out of those 105,000 calls for service that were generated through the public safety system, CAHOOTS teams were involved in 18,000 of those responses. We did 15,000 of those responses without other response systems. So without law enforcement, without um, you know public works, without a fire engine or an ambulance responding with us. And of those calls, 13,000 of them would have required police or the fire department to respond if we hadn't been there. And through all of those thousands, you know, dozens of thousands of calls for service that CAHOOTS teams are responding to on a daily basis, we only needed to call for police cover 311 times last year. And that 311 times that we called for police cover was almost an even split between situations where things had escalated and there was physical aggression or violence and situations where we had reach the point where we needed police support because uh, the individual would be best served with an involuntary psych hold to get them to the hospital uh, because they needed such a high level of care and were unable to uh, contract for safety on their own. So, um, you know, when, when, you, when you really, you know, slice this, because we are part of the system, as opposed to being referred by, you know, a private crisis line, uh, we can have a really tremendous impact in our in the community, and there is a, a profound cost savings that's associated with that. Um, and we can move on to the next slide. So, how does that work? How does all of this stuff that happens, you know, on phones and dispatch and radios actually play out in the field? Um, and so, we'll highlight this slide briefly. Um, this flowchart really helps demonstrate how we operate within that larger system. So a crisis occurs out in the community. Um, somebody, whether it's the individual experiencing the crisis or a third party, uh, either a crisis line or bystander, family member, somebody calls into the public safety answering point. And uh, the, the dispatchers and call takers are going to identify what the service need is in there, whether it's fire and EMS, police, or cahoots. Uh, they're going to send their unit out from there. Um, if fire and EMS or the police show up on scene and they recognize that this is something where CAHOOTS is the best resource to send out, they're not obligated to pursue that intervention and, or follow through in that interaction. Maybe they start to talk to this person and they say, oh, no, this is a CAHOOTS call. They get on the radio and ask for CAHOOTS right away. And the intention then is that CAHOOTS is coming in to disengage that other resource uh, so that officers can you know, get back to their um, you know, drunk driving patrol um, or uh, you know, that that fire engine can really get back to the firehouse so that they can do their training or let their just paramedics and firefighters just, you know, actually get a full night's sleep. Um, so however it happens, CAHOOTS becomes involved as the primary response. Our first objective when we get on a scene is going to be to de-escalate. And then from there, really assess. Is this something that we can resolve on scene, um, you know, through support and stabilization and the referrals to other services? Or is this something where part of our resolution is going to require transport to another resource? Um, if we do need to give somebody a ride, that's going to be free of charge. So nobody has to worry about an ambulance bill. Um, you know, nobody has to worry about hidden fees associated with the CAHOOTS response. The places that we take folks to when we do transport them are going to be either um, shelter, other service providers, or the hospital. Um, one of the things that we do to really help is that, you know, maybe there's somebody who's experiencing, um, you know, a very heightened crisis, right? And it's at a, at a relatively high acuity level. Um, 
we're all in agreement that this person is going to be best served if they can get connected to that higher level of care at the hospital. Uh, but they're experiencing so much anxiety uh, that the process of walking through the front doors of the emergency room lobby, sitting down at triage, telling somebody that uh, this is what I'm experiencing, and then waiting for some indeterminate period of time in, in the waiting room, and then being escorted back by some unnamed tech um, is just going to be a series of triggers that are going to make it harder and harder for this person to access the higher level of care that they really need and deserve to be able to, um, you know, access in a compassionate way. Cahoots is able to do direct admits into the hospital. And so if that person says, I'm, I'm too scared to go through triage, but I know that I really need to get to the hospital to keep myself safe tonight, we can call the charge nurse and say, hey, this is the Cahoots unit, we're coming in with somebody. And we can skip that front door process and take somebody right through the back doors so that there's less of that, um, you know, time of uncertainty and open-endedness that, that can really contribute to that anxiety. Um, if we're taking somebody to another service, one of the things we're going to do is really make sure that that service is appropriate for what the patient needs, uh, that the service is open, and that that facility is able to receive that person when we show up there. So sometimes that means we do a little bit of the intake paperwork while we're driving over, or um, you know we're going to do a warm handoff and spend some time with providers at that resource, really talking about what it is that we saw in the field before we brought that person into them. Uh, and so we can move on to the next slide. And so this, uh, sorry, I forgot this was in here. Um, so this is just a reiteration of that, you know, like I said um, earlier, 105,000 calls for service um, were requested through the Eugene Police Dispatch in 2019. Uh, Cahoots responded to 18,000 of those. We did 15,000 without any other sort of resources. And, um, you know, we'll, I'll highlight just one last statistic on this slide. Um, the Eugene Police Department estimates that we have an arrest uh, diversion rate of five to 8%. So that's, you know, out of those, 18,000 calls that Cahoots responded to, five to 8% of them um, would have been arrested or otherwise faced other involvement with the criminal legal system if Cahoots hadn't responded. Are you ready to move on? Yeah, I'm ready. Sorry, next okay, slide. Okay, great, yeah. sure. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the ways that, that we, you know, facilitate that cost savings to our community. Um, when it comes to our work in ER diversions, uh, we, we really have been able to find a lot of success in quantifying that savings. Uh, it's also been, you know, really um, easier than we thought to really articulate the specific responses that we have that contribute to that. Um, primary assessment is when our, our EMTs are coming in and checking in with somebody who's saying, uh, you know, maybe the complaint is that um, feeling like a tight water. This is a really good example that came up from a patient a couple of years ago. Uh, they lost their job and were starting to feel like a really tight water balloon all the time is how they put it. Um, and so they wanted Cahoots to come out and check in with them because they were just kind of irritated and just tense all the time. Um, and it was, that was different than what they were used to. And it, it turned out that this person was hypertensive. Uh, and so that full water balloon feeling was, was high blood pressure. Um, and our EMT was able to say, okay, so we need to talk to your primary physician about getting you on some beta blockers or an ACE inhibitor. Um, you know, wound care is both those general injuries that our unhoused neighbors experience um, because, you know, they might be forced to walk around all day. Um, there might be other, uh, you know, factors that, that are making it more difficult for them to attend to their physical health, uh, but also uh, in working with folks in, uh, who are experiencing adverse effects of substance use. Uh, wound care becomes a way for us to really come in and start to engage in harm reduction conversations with, with our patients. Um, you know, talking about if, if you're, if you are, you know, constantly having foot injuries because you're walking around all day, then maybe this is a, ch a chance for us to connect to advocates that could help somebody get um, access to the public transportation system again after they got kicked off the bus five years ago. Um, if, if somebody is experiencing, um, you know, ulcerated wounds on their feet related to unmanaged diabetes, then this is a referral for us to make to our, our medical clinic. Um, and, and for those who maybe um, have a wound that's related to substance use, we have some opportunities to talk with them about that substance use, um, about um, less detrimental ways that they might be able to use and um, you know, what resources are available to them for recovery or sobriety if that's what they're interested in. Um, medication management is another really big one, um, particularly um, with folks who are starting new medications and they may be experiencing side effects that they're not used to or are alarming to them, being able to call and have CAHOOTS teams come out, evaluate them and talk about the medications that they're on is, is really a valuable way to keep somebody out of the hospital. Um, we um, 
are, you know, I think it's, it goes without saying that we are constantly being called out to situations where, you know, substance use disorder or suicidal ideation are the key components uh, of the crisis. And because we can take somebody directly to detox or sobering, we don't need to worry about them going to the hospital. Um, for those folks who are experiencing suicidal ideation, we can do a risk assessment and contract for safety that doesn't obligate them to go into the hospital. Um, failure to thrive is just like this, you know, where we're seeing folks who are in some really desperate situations where um, hygiene is at a deficit, where sanitation is something that's not going to be able to manage, that they're not going to be able to manage on their own. Um, but because we can come in and, and provide some of that support, do some of that cleaning or get folks connected to disability services, we can avoid that, that time spent in the hospital. Um, you know, and lift assists is, is where we come in and help folks who've just fallen down. And um, with chronic utilizers and frequent uh, flyers, one of the things that's really important there is really looking at the fact that um, folks are generally in this position of, access, of, of reaching out to the hospital because they perceive other systems to be inaccessible to them or uh, you know, they've experienced oppression and marginalization by those systems. And so uh, we have an opportunity to really come in and talk about what hasn't worked for them before, uh, what else might be available and how we can have work to support them accessing that emergency room uh, as an emergency resource and not something that they're going to as, as their first uh, you know, attempt to reach out and address something. Um, and so we can move to the next slide. Because we have been able to quantify that work in our emergency room diversions uh, you know, quite successfully, we've been able to quantify our cost savings. Um, so when it comes to our work in reducing population health spending, uh, you know, increasing the efficacy of medical treatments, reducing hospitalizations, just generally keeping folks out of the emergency room um, or you know, at bare minimum avoiding that uh, unpaid bill for an ambulance ride, uh, we estimate that we save our community about $14.8 million a year just in our, our services related to you know, ambulance rides and emergency room visits. Out of that 14.8, almost $5 million a year that, that we're saving to our community, uh, we have estimated that approximately $4.1 million of that savings is to Medicaid. Um, and so we arrived at that statistic by looking at uh, the percentage of folks receiving services at other wiper programming uh, who are also on, on the Oregon Health Plan, which is our Medicaid. Uh, and then we extrapolated that to our, our patient population for CUDS in general. Um, so that's, that's $4.1 million that we're saving just to Medicaid on a $2.2 million a year budget. Um, 14.8 million if you really kind of blow that out to include private insurers and those who are uninsured. Um, so while we've been able to quantify our work on this side, on the next slide here, you can see where we have an impact in jail diversion. Unfortunately, we haven't been able to really secure the partnerships that we need from, um, from local law enforcement to quantify the, the amount of money that we're saving our community when it comes to this jail diversion. But I do really wanna highlight this because there is a lot of work that we're able to do with vulnerable populations that would otherwise end up in the criminal legal system, uh, spending a night in jail, um, you know, because as a result of the crisis that they're experiencing because there aren't other resources available. Um, public intoxication, uh, CAHOOTS teams are able to do direct admits to the sobering and detox center. So that means that uh, for that, you know, person who's, crisis is really around um, not having four walls and a roof to drink a beer behind. And um, so they're, they're out in public for that. Um, they don't need to have police encounters to get lodged and sobering for so they have a place to sleep things off for the night. Um, so that means that our officers are generally going to be less obligated to handle these situations of public intoxication. Um, related disorderly behavior is an area where CAHOOTS teams come in as, as the first responder and either uh, don't need uh, law enforcement um, to be present for the entire interaction or we're able to uh, you know, have that entire response and de-escalation without law enforcement being involved at all. Um, one of the reasons that we highlight disorderly behavior here is because so often when we go out and talk with somebody who is in that really um, you know, highly escalated space, uh, we start to hear that a lot of that is informed by the fact that maybe they spent their entire day just trying to find a bathroom to use uh, and someplace to get a meal. Um, and instead of having access to those, to meet those basic needs of relieving yourself um, and uh, feeding yourself, this person is told, no, you can't be here. No, you need to go somewhere else um, and, and are being constantly turned away. And, and what manifests as that, that outburst is really informed by desperation um, and, um, you know, really just uh, that lack of those most basic human needs being, uh, being met. And so um, when that person is really escalated and, and being presenting as disorderly, when a CAHOOTS member, team member comes in with a bottle of water or a granola bar and a blanket and says, hey, let's just sit down for a minute 
so you can catch your breath and get something to eat before we talk about what's going on, we can see markedly different interactions than if, if we immediately entered into that and we're really focused on um, getting, the, getting the behavior to change in a way that we want it to. When we say, hey, we see that you're upset and it looks like it might be because of this. Can we help you with meeting these basic needs? We show that person that there's some mutual trust uh, in, in maintaining a safe interaction and that we see them as a whole person and that we recognize that sometimes, um, you know, what, what comes out in that outburst of, of maybe threats of violence or, or threats of harm against self are really informed by, um, you know, feel, a feeling of powerlessness when it comes to that um, inability to access those basic human needs. Um, for folks that may be called in as, as wandering in a traffic or roadway because they're, uh, you know, experiencing high acuity symptoms that are leading to them to be disorganized or um, intoxication is, is impairing them in other ways. These are calls where CAHOOTS teams are able to come out and do a lot of work. Dispute mediation is something that's really important um, where if CAHOOTS teams weren't able to come out and respond the first time this group, you know, a, a couple of people start to argue, um, if, if we hadn't been there for that, that first incidence where somebody called in and things escalated, somebody may end up spending the night in jail, um, you know, because the, the fight continued for hours on end. And so uh, because CAHOOTS response happens generally at a priority level that's below what it would trigger a police officer to respond, uh, we have a lot more opportunity to do this prevention work. Um, trespassing and prohibited camping is really related to housing crisis. Generally, if CAHOOTS teams are going out on a situation that's related to trespassing, it's because somebody is just trying to find a place to sleep for the night and uh, may not be aware of other housing resources or may need help in accessing them after hours. Uh, and then finally, as I mentioned, you know, at the top of this slide, um, secure sobering is a specific subset of, of substance use that we really like to highlight uh, because this is um, by having that EMT as part of that response, we're able to do the medical clearance out in the field that somebody needs to be lodged and secure sobering. Um, so if, if they're, um, if, if the substance that they need that time to sober from is methamphetamines and uh, a more general population setting for sobering isn't going to be appropriate, there's more advanced medical clearance that needs to come along with that. And our, our teams are able to provide that and then get those folks lodged directly. And so that again, you know, really helps us reserve those other more traditional resources for those most high intensity situations and, and allows us to really have a lot of um, latitude with how we operate within our public safety system. Um, and we can move on to the next slide. So despite doing all that work, despite responding to all these different types of situations that are unfolding in our community, um, like I said earlier, we've never had a staff member who's been injured as a result of patient contact. I, and, and, and this slide really, I think, underscores how we've been able to accomplish that. Uh, that starts with our scene awareness and in our, both our training of, of new staff and, and then continuing education for uh, you know, more, more veteran members of the CUTS team. Uh, one of the things that we really need to hammer home is, is the, the, how the environment informs an interaction. And so scene awareness starts by really looking at at the situation before we've even gotten out of the van. That's how do we park this vehicle in a way that's going to be therapeutic? This, uh, you know, maybe we don't park right in front of the house that we're going into to talk to somebody. Maybe we just park right around the corner uh, so that their nosy neighbors don't start bugging us or, you know, are going to be gossiping about, uh, you know, somebody uh, in the neighborhood. Um, are there children present? Uh, you know, what, what are the roads like? Are we deep into an apartment complex parking lot? Um, where, where are we going to park our van? Um, can we park our van in a way so that as it, when our interaction is over, we don't need to worry about backing up and doing that 60 point Austin Powers kind of shuffling turn to get out of a tight spot? Um, can we do a lot more of that work up front so that if we have a patient who really needs to get to another service with some, um, some speed, um, that we're not taking that time to kind of do those things after the fact when maybe our driver is going to be a little bit more distracted and thinking about getting to the hospital through rush hour traffic. Um, clear communication is really vital with our, our partners in our response teams. And so we try to pair our staff with uh, regular uh, shift partners. And so uh, for the five years that I was a full-time first responder for the CAHOOTS team, I had the same shift partner 30 six hours a week. So th the three 12 hour days that I worked on the team, I was always with the same medic. And that meant that we were able to build, build a really, um, you know, expansive set of, of nonverbal communication skills uh, that we had an understanding of how each other worked within different interventions. Um, and it really allowed for really seamless partnerships out in the field. Um, radio communication is also obviously key because that is how we receive all of our calls for service. 
that's how we access uh, those other supports that we need either for a medical emergency or uh, various situations where we might need to call police in. Uh, and so that means that we need to be able to talk on the radio the same as other public safety systems. And so our staff are trained on how to use a phonetic alphabet, how to do a top-down description for somebody, um, just how to operate within that system so that we can convey that, um, you know, we see and respect the professionalism of other systems. Uh, and, and we really recognize that, um, that that role that we're in as first responders within said system. Defensive driving is really important. We've never had uh, a van get totaled um, in the 31 years we've been doing this too. And that's because we follow the speed limit, you know, um, keep a, a, a decent distance behind, uh, you know, the car in front of us when we're on the highway. Um, you know, really paying attention to where the other cars on the road and again, how we're parking. Um, you know, appearance is another thing that's really important. I'm sure you've noticed in the slides that uh, we, we do wear some of the same colors as public safety, navy blue, black, forest green, um, but we, we try to make sure that we distinguish ourselves from other uh, public safety responses by having that, that uniform really be made up of a hoodie and a t-shirt, jeans and work boots. Um, we try to make sure that we emphasize the logo of Whitebird Clinic on our, on our uh, clothing in high contrast colors so that when somebody's first waking up in that park, you know, early dawn hours because the Cahoots team came out to check on them, they can see really quickly that this says, uh, that this says Whitebird Clinic and Cahoots on it as opposed to Eugene Police or Eugene Springfield Fire Department. And that, that physical appearance um, can oftentimes be enough to really help start de-escalating somebody before we've even engaged with them verbally. Um, I think we need to recognize that, um, you know, this isn't a criticism of any individual officers, but for, for many um, folks in communities throughout the country, just seeing that, that police uniform can be a trigger. Uh, and so when we remove that visual trigger, uh, we are sending the message that this isn't going to be the same type of interaction that that person may have experienced or um, that this is that this is unlikely to go the same route that it went for, you know, a family member or a loved one previously. Um, outside of our work in day-to-day -day responses, self-care and clinical debrief are really important. We want our staff to be able to, um, you know, be their best selves when they're out responding to calls for service and, um, and that means that we need to really make sure that folks have opportunities for self-care through time off or, um, you know, help, helping them with getting access to a gym so they can have that, that physical outlet. Uh, but then also making sure that twice a week we have that space for clinical debrief for folks to talk about the impact of this work. That's really important. Um, and, you know, finally, the last two slides here, last two, um, you know, kind of points on the slide um, around intuition and verbal de-escalation is really trusting your instincts and recognizing that, um, that, that we need that mutual trust um, when we're engaging with folks and that if something seems off, it probably is. If you notice that somebody's clenching their fists and is, is breathing really shallowly, shallowly and rapidly, uh, that, that, that they're starting to escalate. And so you gotta trust your gut, you know, rec lean on that spidey sense um, and utilize the skills in verbal de-escalation um, to, to really maintain that safe scene for everybody involved. Uh, you can move on now. Um, additionally, outside of our work responding to calls for service out in the field that are being dispatched to us, we have COOTS representatives that are gonna be at pretty much every single sort of uh, coordinated care meeting, um, complex case management, um, you know, uh, frequent systems utilizer meetings. Every time there's some sort of gathering that's gonna be focusing on a specific population or a specific set of needs uh, where COOTS has some level of involvement, you're gonna see a representative there. And so um, high risk team is us sitting down at the same table as law enforcement, uh, our county behavioral health and fire and EMS to really say, um, this is how we can better support these folks most in need in our community. Um, you know, same goes for those uh, frequent user um, of systems engagements. Um, who are the folks that we're seeing most often that would really benefit from housing as the key to reduce their reliance on other systems? Um, and uh, the downtown care team is focused on, on youth and, and young adults um, that are accessing services in our downtown core um, and, and really looking at how CAHOOTS can provide resources and after hours support uh, for those other systems. Um, you know, the last thing I'll highlight here is that um, it's, it's kind of funny to see how often CAHOOTS pops up as, as a component of other care plans within our community. And, um, you know, this is one of the reasons that I was really excited that NAMI was facilitating this opportunity for me to meet, you, meet with you all today, um, is that uh, there is such, there really when, when we're coming out and responding to these calls for service because some sort of other need has gone unmet um, and, and that, that family are, are really struggling to figure out how to respond to that, that unmet need or you know, an individual is really trying to find ways to access support um, 
and and they're they're apprehensive and fearful. And so actually, we do a lot of work with our own local NAMI uh, chapter when it comes to that patient advocacy. Um, we're frequently making referrals to um, this, you know, for support groups or one-on-one -on -one, uh, supports, and that is all because we have this opportunity to engage with all of the other um, systems of care in our community. Um, and one of, the, one of the things that's really interesting too is that anytime you call somebody, one of these services, uh, anytime you call a private practice um, after hours in Eugene and Springfield, CAHOOTS is gonna be part of that after hours call, uh, you know, after hours message that you receive. So, you know, if this is an emergency, please hang up and call 911 or um, if you're in crisis, call CAHOOTS for a response. Um, so, you know, I think it's our, our patient advocacy has really underscored and helped a lot of other systems understand how we can be a part of their safety plans and how we can be a part of that after hour support for, um, you know, their most vulnerable patients. Uh, and on the next slide, please. Uh, we've extended that work and advocacy, not just to connecting folks to other um, supports for, uh, you know, responding for behavior, behavioral health or substance use, um, but really understanding that um, for many, vulnerable members of our community, housing is the key to uh, really accessing those, uh, you know, increased supports and, and really obtaining that stability in their lives. Um, Eugene has the highest incidence of homelessness per capita in the U.S., according to the CDC, and we have woefully inadequate shelter. Um, the winter months here are, um, are deadly. Um, even if it's not freezing, it's still well within the confines of inclement weather that would give somebody hypothermia. And, and we just simply don't have enough shelter resources to meet the need that's out there. Um, but recognizing that sometimes if we can get somebody somewhere to sleep for a night, give them somewhere where they can safely and securely store their belongings while they go and, and do a series of appointments the next week, you know, we can have a lot of really profound impacts in other areas of their life. Uh, and so we've had to get creative with our partners out in the community to really address this need. Um, this gentleman that you see here holding his pup um, alongside a CAHOOTS team, a Whitebird homeless case manager, and one of the sergeants from the downtown uh, station for the Eugene Police Department are all gathered together because we really saw that, especially with folks who are trying to access services in the downtown core, and were disallowed from other shelter resources, um, that if we could just get them lodged somewhere, uh, there would be an immediate reduction in their contact with police, um, that case management would be able to find them uh, for appointments, you know, pick them up and take them to the doctor, or even just be able to meet them somewhere to, uh, you know, bring them a new prescription. Uh, and so um, Eugene Police Department leveraged their relationships with other uh, public safety resources. And so this hut is one of three that are alongside a dumpster and a couple of porta potties in the parking lot of one of our downtown fire stations. Um, so using law enforcement as our, our way to really identify the folks that were really most vulnerable that were having those, the, the highest incidence of, of unnecessary law enforcement contacts, um, Whitebird case management and CAHOOTS teams were then able to work together and, and you know, help find these people and get them lodged. Um, we utilized a partnership with the organization where I volunteer, Community Supported Shelters, uh, to build these huts. Um, and through that partnership, we've been able to really expand what's available for folks experiencing housing crisis in our community, whether it's a short-term placement in one of these huts, um, you know, a, a longer-term placement in one of the sanctioned camps in town, or um, even with another housing resource to actually get folks into studio apartments for a couple of months while they start a job and save up money for that first last uh, and deposit to move into a, an apartment. Um, you know, we, we have seen a lot of, of benefit that comes from this and um, have, have seen, you know, for some folks like this gentleman here, um, a real profound reduction in the, in, in the occurrences in which they need to re rely on CAHOOTS support. Um, and anecdotally, we're hearing that because they have the security and stability of a place to sleep every night, they're a lot more able to manage those triggers um, and, and symptoms when they emerge. And you can move on to the next slide. Um, the final thing that I really wanted to highlight with you all before we move into question and answer uh, is that uh, part of the reason I'm, I'm talking to you all um, from Oregon is that we are very invested in spreading this model and helping other communities really evaluate public safety systems and identify how mobile crisis services could have a role to play in really, you know, a reimagined public safety system. Um, that has taken the form uh, in the past for us of stakeholder presentations where about a year and a half ago, myself and a colleague went to, down to Oakland and San Francisco and spent a few days just meeting with community groups in large forum settings to talk about the model and provide opportunities for um, just dialogue around what it would mean for a community to bring in a similar service. In Oakland, 
Um, you know, that was a, a town hall with over 400 people in attendance and some just really beautiful conversation that led to them, including peer support staff as part of their mobile crisis response program once it gets up and running. And I really don't think that the peer support idea would have been at the table if it hadn't been for that town hall. Um, we provide a lot of technical advisory support in designing vans and, um, you know, other components of service delivery, uh, as well as, you know, really helping design these programs and then train the staff to go out and respond. Um, we've been able to help set up the uh, mobile crisis response programs in Olympia, Washington with the crisis response unit. Denver, Colorado star program was a result of our, our work and our support. Uh, right now, as we speak, we're also actively helping the Rochester, New York mobile crisis program get up and running as well as Portland, Oregon's street response program. Um, and uh, in, in the coming months, we, we see some avenues opening up for us to do some work in Maryland and in California. And so, um, you know, there's, there's a lot going on. A lot of communities are really looking at this and there's a lot of opportunity for us to really come in and really help provide those lessons learned from the things that we've been doing well for the 31 years and then really reinforce how those lessons learned and those best practices can um, really build on uh, what local voices are saying, what consumers and, and the Finger Lakes are saying they really need from mobile crisis, you know, what folks in, um, you know, in Iowa are saying they want as opposed to what might be going on in Pennsylvania uh, and, and really help create these programs that are going to be built um, by and for, you know, the folks that, that really are gonna be served most by, by these resources. Uh, and finally, we've, we've been able to touch on some work with legislation um, that has uh, manifested itself in the Cahoots Act, which Senator Ron Wyden authored. This was presented to Congress in the fall by uh, Representative Peter DeFazio. And right now it's hung up in a committee. I think it's the um, budget committee right now. Um, if, this, if this act passes Congress, this will open up Medicaid block grants to fund 95% of program operations for the first three years. Um, and th that really means is, is funding for the pilot phase. That's an opportunity to really kind of focus on service delivery and meeting community needs instead of really focusing on dollars and cents. And by having that kind of three year period for Medicaid dollars to really be at the forefront, that's time for a community to experience those cost savings and really identify how they can divert um, you know, really an increase in funding through that cost savings from other resources to really help support this program ongoing. So if this is something that you're really curious about, you know, please reach out to your local representatives. Um, there's tremendous potential for this, uh, you know, as, as we really see how Congress takes shape here in 2021. Um, so we can, we can touch on the, the next slide here. I don't have a lot of a content related to this. This slide I, I kept in here, this is for our, our local presentations. Obviously, we're not expecting you all um, from across the country to be calling Eugene and Springfield public safety systems. But the reason I kept this slide in here was really to show you how frequently our systems are used by the hospital, by other resources. So all three of these vans that you see here are in the auxiliary ambulance bay at our downtown emergency room. Um, all three of these vehicles were called out to situations where we were able to connect somebody to the hospital without the trauma of that ambulance ride, um, without going into the, the hospital in the back of a police car. Um, you know, these are really high acuity situations, but all three of these teams also uh, help facilitate folks leaving the hospital and getting connected to lower levels of care and integrating back into the community. Uh, and so it's, it's just, this was also one of my last shifts as a first responder. And so we keep the slide in here just to really reinforce how much work our teams are doing out in the field. We're not just kind of sitting idle and responding to a couple of things a day. When you show up for that 12 hour shift, uh, you're gonna be just bouncing from call to call to call. Uh, really just, you know, and our, our teams are just out there putting their heart and soul into this work. And, um, you know, there, there's, yeah, again, just just so much potential for, for you all in the Finger Lakes to really kind of evaluate how this type of a model could be, you know, modified, edited, adjusted to really respond to the needs of your own community. Um, the very last slide, which we can go to right now, has our contact information on it. If you really want to learn more, um, you can go to uh, the web, learn more about Whitebird Clinic in general. You can go to whitebirdclinic.org. And um, if you want to learn more about Cahoots, we have a specific page there. Um, within the website, there's also a form that you can fill out if you want to find a time to set up a meeting with me or other representatives to really talk more specifically about the CAHOOTS program. So um, at this point, um, I'd like to stop relying on slides and uh, kind of shift this over to a Q&A. Thank you so much, Tim. I really appreciate it. That was really a great presentation. And I think that you answered so many questions. We see several um, 
several responses saying this answered my question. <laughs> so um, I do I do have a, several questions here. I just want to open this up a little bit so I can see. Um, uh, I do have a couple of questions I want to make sure that we get to. Um, why have you limited uh, only to two cities? Do you service the rural areas of the county considering you're getting county funding? We have only been serving the city of Springfield for the last five or six years. Um, for the first 25 years of the program, we were focused just on Eugene. Um, the reason that we we're focused just on Eugene for so long was because the city of Springfield just couldn't afford to bring us in. Um, we have since by having that, that contribution from the county and now a few years later, the city of Springfield is starting to pick up a, a portion of the funding for services uh, on that side of the river. Um, the reason that we stuck with the Eugene Springfield metro area is because that is our population, uh, our most dense population center for our county. Um, because our funding is coming from the city of Eugene, we have to stay within Eugene city limits. Um, with our, our funding from the county for services in Springfield, we are starting to branch out into more rural parts of our community. Um, but geography also plays a factor in that. Uh, our, our county is, is, is huge and it, it runs from the Pacific Ocean um, up into the Cascade Mountain Range. And so it takes about three hours to get from the western end to the eastern end. Um, it we would not be able to really provide timely responses if we were trying to do a countywide resource that was being dispatched just out of Eugene. And so some of the things that we've done is that on the coast um, where, where things are fairly isolated before you get to the coastal mountain range, um, we've provided training for crisis responders who are embedded within the fire department. Um, and, and they're responding to the kind of network of communities there. Um, it's gonna be a while before that part of the county really has the other resources that we would need to be able to make a CAHOOTS style program effective. Um, you know, right now, if we had cahoots operating in our coastal community, we would only be taking people to the hospital. Um, and I would argue that we'd probably be overwhelming that system. Um, on the other side, as you move east um, up into the Cascade Mountain Range, um, the communities are, are, are too far spread apart for the model that we have in our urban center here. And um, as we see the city of Springfield start to increase their support of uh, the cahoots program in Springfield, that's going to free up more county dollars for us to start to work with those more disconnected communities. Um, we've started to work with uh, those more rural communities through other services within Wiper Clinic, and so we're really optimistic to see how that work can translate um, and how we can use the relationships that we're building now to bring in those mobile crisis resources. Thank you. Um, another question that's come in is how much do you dispatch out to immigrant communities of different stat of different statuses in rural areas and what prep preparation or training do you give members of cahoots about the discrimination and vulnerabilities inherent in this broad community mm -hmm. also BIPOC communities. Um, uh, specifically in terms of critical, alternative, non-mainstream racial justice knowledge. Yeah. Um, so everybody that, that works on CAHOOTS has, uh, goes through restorative justice training. Um, we send everybody through uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion training as well um, with, with annual refreshers on that. Um, you know, additionally, we have uh, been really lucky, I think, in some of our recruitment over the last few years. And we are starting to um, bring in team members for whom English is a learned language. Uh, and so when it comes to our work with uh, Spanish speaking populations, I would argue that the last couple of years have um, been really positive in terms of outreach and, and connection. Um, we, we have a stewardship council um, that's comprised of community members that really helps guide our, our practices uh, and our, our responses to make sure that what we're doing is culturally responsive. Um, I, you know, we, we try to stay away from using the, the term culturally informed because that assume, that's, I think indicates that at some point you've learned everything and there's nothing else, but being culturally responsive really kind of articulates that this is a dynamic process and a space where we need to be uh, engaged as, as perpetual learners. Um, so so we, we really work with, with our service partners too. Um, agencies that are, are working with specific populations, maybe undocumented or uh, for those for whom um, English isn't a primary language, um, you know, it's, it's our other partnerships in the community that have really helped us um, with our responses. And um, that's something that I think we really need to continue working on. Eugene is a very white community. Um, 
and our responders for CAHOOTS look like that. And that is not a reflection of who is most in need in our community. And so we are, we're, we're constantly trying to do better. Thank you. Um, would you speak a bit to the relationship that you have with law enforcement agencies mm -hmm. and um, the just uh, maybe a little discussion on funding conversations that you have, your understanding and respecting each other's roles. Mm -hmm. um, could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Um, so we're, let's start with funding. Um, the, the CAHOOTS service budget for the city of Eugene um, is approved by the city council. Um, that money is in addition to other traditional public safety systems. So city council says, here's how much money we're going to spend on CAHOOTS in Eugene this year. Uh, that money is then given to the Eugene Police Department, uh, who also oversees the communication system. Uh, the money that's given to the police department is to have them be the liaison to contract with a provider for the mobile crisis resource. Uh, we've been very lucky that uh, we've been able to be that vendor for the full 31 years that there's been this system in place. Um, but when it comes to you know where we send our invoices every month to get to get paid, we're sending our invoices to the Eugene Police Department or you know the Springfield Police Department. Um, as such, we need to have regular meetings with them to make sure that we're fulfilling both ends of our contract. And so once a month, uh, administrative leadership from the CAHOOTS team meets with a lieutenant from the police department and a dispatch supervisor. And we talk about what's going well, what isn't, um, and how we can address those things. Um, you know, that becomes a space for us to talk about how dispatch could uh, ask questions in a different way or, you know, be more trauma informed when they're dealing with folks who are, um, you know, really escalated and expressing a lot of fear and hesitation. Um, you know, our, uh, this, this is a place where the lieutenant can, can let our teams know that maybe somebody got really over eager and um, complicated things for an investigation that was going on because they weren't willing to wait for officers to tell them it was clear to come in. Um, so on the back end, on the business end, you know, it, it requires a lot of coordination and um, the relationship has always been constructive. We don't always agree, um, definitely, uh, but we're always able to find compromise. And, um, you know, most recently, um, some of that work on our end to really do that advocacy for vulnerable populations has resulted in um, a stay on enforcement of camping restrictions in our community. And that was because CAHOOTS teams were being sent out to talk to every single person that got um, displaced uh, when a camp was swept. And uh, the lieutenant was saying, how come your teams are just tied up on all these housing calls? And it's like, well, camps are getting swept all the time. If those camps weren't getting swept, folks would have some stability. Um, crisis would be less likely to escalate in those situations. And our teams aren't gonna be spending all night trying to figure out where, where there is a hotel that's willing to take another person in. Uh, and so, you know, really saying, this is how your camp sweeps are impacting your mobile crisis response really helped underscore why the CDC was saying, don't sweep these camps. And so, you know, so we were able to really, um, you know, see some progress there. This summer, um, I, you know, I think I would I'd be um, irresponsible if I didn't, you know, acknowledge that this summer definitely created some opportunities for law enforcement to, um, you know, in our community to um, feel frustrated when they saw members of the CAHOOTS team exercising their First Amendment rights. Um, and rather than just kind of shrug our shoulders and say, oh, well, um, you know, what I really saw was our teams really recognizing that we're still first responders. We're still working within the same system. We might not agree with somebody's motivations or, um, you know, what, what industry within public safety they work within, uh, but we still have a role to play. And while those systems still exist, you know, we need to be able to work with them. And so um, by responding to calls, by um, being plugged into the 911 system, we can reduce the likelihood that somebody's going to have police encounters because of, you know, the crisis that they're experiencing, uh, because of substance use, because of, you know, their poverty. Um, by being out there and having these responses available to folks, we also get to break that cycle um, of, of marginalization and oppression. And um, we have to be willing to have hard conversations with, with patrol officers, uh, you know, with command staff, um, you know, with, with the hospitals. Um, in the past, uh, this, you know, this will be the last thing I say about this question, but uh, when I first started working on CAHOOTS in 2010, I was hearing officers frequently say, hey, this person's gonna be waiting for CAHOOTS, they're code seven. And I was learning the codes uh, because we need to be able to use that radio system. And code seven is the lunch break code. And so what I realized was every time I heard 
and officers say we have Kahoot, we have a Cahoots patient who's code seven. What they were really saying is, hey, this person's out to lunch. Just send the Cahoots unit go deal with them. And and that told us that there was a profound implicit bias um, that was occurring within the Eugene Police Department. And so we started to challenge that when we would see that officer who said code seven, we'd say, hey, the way that you're talking to that person is really reducing them to you know a. a set of symptoms that they're experiencing right now. Um, you're denying you know, this person's humanity by really saying that they're just out to lunch. Uh, and, and we've actually started to see a shift. You know, it's, it's taken 10 years, but we, we see officers talking about folks, you know, recognizing that they're experiencing something that, that, that um, rather than call somebody a schizophrenic, this is, uh, you know, I have a patient who's reporting that their um, symptoms of schizophrenia have worsened and they really need cahoots contact. That's drastically different, right? Then we're recognizing that this is a whole person who is an expert in their lived experience and that that officer is recognizing that there's a need uh, for whom they are not the appropriate resource and are trying to get cahoots to come in because we really, um, you know, you don't bake a cake with a wrench, right? You know, and so we want to make sure that um, the wrench stays in the toolbox and we're going for the measuring cups instead. Thank you. That language is so important. And I, I know that you're saying some very important things that NAMI families uh, need to hear uh, and uh, want to hear. Um, it, it sounds like the conversations that you have uh, might de-escalate that uh, the language of defunding police. What it sounds like is that you have really redefined public safety to include all of these things mm -hmm. and to uh, so all of the entities are respectful of um, you know the the ways that this operation, help you all and your community. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering about the, um, uh, about that, you know, uh, do, you, do you think that since this has been in place for some time that you have averted in your community many of the, or much of the trauma that other communities have experienced with lethal response? Uh, can you talk a little bit about if that's happened in your community, um, if you think that CAHOOTS has been able to mitigate that quite a bit, um, just do, does that make sense? I mean, can, yeah. you, can you speak a little bit to that? Yeah, um, you know, and it's hard because really what we're doing is we're speculating on, on, on law enforcement that has had the privilege of this resource for three decades, you know? And so I, I tried to uh, talk to one of the, the crime analysis folks um, with Eugene Police Department. I was like, can we just look at like arrest rates pre and post implementation of Cahoots. And he's like, you want me to go pull some paper files out of the basement? Um, you know, so it's, I think we have to recognize that there's been a lot more opportunity for a larger cultural shift within law enforcement here in our region. Um, it has been my experience that both the current police chief and the prior police chief really recognized that uh, mental health and addiction um, and poverty weren't moral issues and that approaching these things through the lens of enforcement was only going to exacerbate the issues. Um, we do still see deadly police encounters occurring with the Eugene Police Department. They're infrequent uh, and are generally occurring in situations where cahoots probably wouldn't ever have been involved to begin with. Um, you know, a, an escalated parent bringing a gun into a school, um, you know, somebody um, running out of an apartment building and charging at an officer with a knife in their hand. Those aren't the calls that cahoots teams are responding to. but because we are going into these calls for service, the first time somebody reaches out, uh, you know, before things have been allowed to escalate for, you know, an entire day or night, um, we are really preventing um, the opportunity for that, that real, you know, you, you call it, you reference it de-escalation, right? We're, we're going in and we're intervening in these situations before they've even gotten to the point where law enforcement would need to be involved. And because of that role in prevention, I think that we are really, um, you know, contributing to a, a safer environment. Officers um, are less likely to have those interactions with somebody who is in that really, you know, profound escalated crisis. Um, you know, they have they have an example um, in the form of seeing our cahoots teams respond to calls and then really kind of apply those same skills. And so um, I think it's a really common sight in a lot of cities to see an officer standing over somebody, um, 
when they're sitting or laying on the ground while they're writing them that ticket for illegal camping. What we have seen with officers here in Eugene and Springfield is that they use what uh, we on Cahoots call the empathy squad, but which is something that Cahoots teams use all the time, literally getting down on some on the same level as somebody so that we can have, um, you know, that um, that conversation with direct eye contact and really convey that mutual trust. Um, so the empathy squad is you kneel down one knee on the ground, um, you know, supporting yourself with your other foot that allows our teams to kind of jump up and move back if they need to really quickly. Um, but also says, Hey, I'm right here with you in this. And we've seen officers start to actually do that same thing of that squat where they're actually, you know, where they're, they're kneeling down to engage with somebody directly person to person um, that reduces that inherent power dynamic, you know, by saying like, Hey, I see you, I hear you. And I, I need to be in the same space as you for us to have this conversation. Um, some of that has also been helped by the fact that we've had crime prevention specialists and patrol officers who have been former CAHOOTS employees or other employees of other WIPERD programs. And so some components of the WIPERD approach to service provision in general has really been able to spread throughout law enforcement, uh, which in itself, I think, is really anomalous. WIPERD Clinic is a very counterculture group. Uh, when we first started to have this partnership with law enforcement, there was a question of how soon it was going to be before the staff that were doing CAHOOTS were getting arrested. Um, and um, even the name CAHOOTS, I think, is a recognition of the fact that it really took the hippies getting in CAHOOTS with the cops uh, for our community to start to see, you know, real compassionate response. Thank you. How many total dispatch units do you have? Uh, overnight, we have two units, and during the day, we have three units. Uh, we are using two different dispatch centers, one for each jurisdiction that we work in. So Springfield has their own call center for dispatch. All of the responses for Springfield units are going to happen that way. In Eugene, where things are, are busier, it's the bigger city, um, we're using Eugene Police Dispatch, and we have one van overnight and the two vans during the day. So for a metro area, that 60 service hours per day gets to two vans from... 11 p.m. to 11 a.m. and three vans from 11 a.m. to 11 p.m. And do you, uh, do you have new protocols for COVID? And have you, in, have you noticed an increase in a, particularly mental health calls uh, during the COVID response? Yeah, um, when it comes to specific COVID protocols, uh, I mean, there are just um, uh, innumerable uh, sanitation things, you know, spraying stuff down, disinfecting things. Uh, that goes without saying. Um, you know, obviously we're wearing full PPE um, when we're going out and talking to folks. So that's eye protection and N95 mask and then a filter over the top of that. Um, we try to have as many of interactions as we can in settings where we can get good airflow or have something that's out of doors provided we're not going to create an audience by, by moving that interaction outside of a building. Um, we do ask everybody when they're uh, dispatch, excuse me, asks everybody when they're calling in if they've traveled in the last two weeks, if they have any uh, cold or flu symptoms. That's not going to preclude us from showing up, but that's just going to kind of help inform uh, somebody's experience, you know, and, and just kind of let us know that there are other risk factors involved. Um, Wearing that mask, though, has been really problematic because so much of our work is, is nonverbal, right? You know, when you're talking to somebody, making that connection, uh, you know, I see you, you're smiling, you're, you know, you're, you're nodding your head, right? Um, a lot of the things that we do to really tell somebody that we're with them are, are things that you don't say out loud, but come with your face. And when you cover up half of your face all of a sudden you're really losing a lot of your ability to communicate non-verbally. Uh, and so it's been harder to build those connections with folks that we don't know already, where we don't have that rapport. Um, when it comes to the situations that we're coming into, we're seeing medical situations that are a lot uh, more severe because somebody has been avoiding going to talk to their provider in person because they need that diagnostic work. So they have to go in or um, they're, uh, you know, technology can be really challenging to navigate um, on a good day. Uh, and so trying to figure out how to do telemedicine and then feeling comfortable talking to a provider that um, you might not have met in person yet uh, can be really challenging. You know, so we, we see um, a lot of higher acuity situations because things are being put off for, for various reasons related to access. But then, uh, you know, fear, anxiety, um, you know, because of the pandemic and because of the uh, political climate right now have, have been very prevalent. And so we're seeing a lot of folks who are just a lot more scared um, and anxious, you know, than they might have otherwise been, you know, lonely, uh, because you can't go out and get that hug from your neighbor the way you might have before. Sure. Um, a lot of the work that you described sounds much like our community outreach workers that we have. We have mm -hmm. two in the city of Ithaca. Um, de-escalating stressful situations, uh, really meeting people where they're at, 
uh, food security issues, appointment management, um, conflicts that people might be having. Um, so it's, it sounds like we, we actually kind of meet some of these needs uh, and uh, with our community outreach workers. Mm -hmm. So maybe just really supporting them uh, and that program uh, could be a great first step. Yeah. Um, and I see one of our community outreach workers has asked, um, how do you collect data to estimate your savings for ER drives and other related services? How is that calculated? Mm -hmm. um, so without getting too boring about it, um, we start by uh, identifying the specific responses uh, that CAHOOTS teams are having where um, the outcome of the intervention would have likely resulted in a trip to the hospital or an ambulance ride if we hadn't been there. Um, from there, we know that the average uh, cost of a, you know, a we know what the average cost of an ambulance ride is in our county, and then we know how much the ambulance or the average nightly cost of a hospital visit is. Uh, and so from there, we assume that um, if we kept you out of the hospital, we saved you from having one night in the hospital, um, potentially one ambulance ride. And so from there, it's just a matter of looking at our responses. Um, I'm not going to ask you to try and share a screen and pull it back up, but I'll just build on that a little bit here. Um, so in that, in that cost savings slide that we saw earlier, um, there were about 3,000 calls for service uh, that were medical in nature that we diverted from either an ambulance ride or hospitalization. Uh, and so we knew that um, for an ambulance ride, that's 1,800 bucks, that emergency room visit would have been about 2,800 bucks. Um, so very quickly, we were able to say, okay, we kept these many calls from going to the hospital. So we can quantify the savings that way. Um, if folks are interested in more uh, thorough explanation of that, I can pass along a document that really um, outlines our methodology for this and really I think goes in a little bit more detail about how we get arrived at this number. Great, that would be great. Um, I did. I do have another question actually from our county administrator that I wanna make sure gets asked before our evening's done. Um, is there a budget reconciliation with the city and county annually? How is the cost determined to ensure that Whitebird is not operating in the red or making significant profit from the city and county? Um, so, you know, there's some reporting that we have to do every quarter on um, income and expenses. Uh, and then from there, we do, we have to sit down once a year and, and just look at the budget. Were, were we able to cover our costs? Um, if not, um, why? And, um, and then from there, it's, you know, is there the increase that we need to support uh, more overtime because we're going to, a, you know, we've moved to a 24 hour resource. Um, is the city seeing that there's just so many calls for service that are coming in that we want to do a service expansion, you know, and so then do we have the money to adequately staff that service expansion with the resources that we need. Uh, so there is an opportunity at least annually for us to really sit down and, and, and look at that and then go to the city council, talk to the city manager, talk with the, um, you know, administrative command staff at the, at the police department to help highlight needs. Um, one of the things that became really apparent for us this this year has been that um, Kahoot staff are paid nonprofit wages. And I'm sure that most folks on this call know what that means. Um, that is not the same as what compensation you would see if you worked for another first responder program or part of public safety. Um, the Eugene Police Department couldn't afford to bring us up to the hourly wage that we wanted to this fiscal year, but we've been able to identify a three-year plan that is actually going to end up reducing the overall Eugene Police Department budget. But by increasing the hourly wages for CAHOOTS first responders, it should be easier for us to maintain capacity, right? Because we can compensate um, on, a, on a level that is, is more equivalent with the work being done and, and really create more career path opportunities for folks that historically as a nonprofit, we might not have been able to provide. I have about four more questions for you. So if we can kind of get through I think these. we can get them, yeah. Okay, I think so. Um, do you do people in your area know who are in who might be in crisis? Do they call um, and are and how do you kind of make that really known so people can be comfortable doing that? I mean, families experience stigma, uh, mm -hmm. fear, um, just uh, embarrassment. You know, uh, just all sorts of barriers to calling in crisis for help. And I'm wondering how how people know what they're going to get. From, mm -hmm. from cahoots when, when they call you? 
a lot of community education is, is part of this work. Um, every eighth and 10th grader is going to receive a presentation on cahoots and uh, mental wellness um, in their health class each year. Um, we have uh, crisis clinics that are embedded in every high school in our the three school districts in our, our metro area um, that use the CAHOOTS model and are, are staffed by Whitebird. Um, so, you know, I would it's starting with the high school level, um, we do a lot of outreach, a lot of work um, with young people to really recognize symptoms and understand how to call and that um, just because somebody's having a rough day doesn't mean that, you know, they're a bad person or that you can't be friends with them. It just means that they needed some extra support, right? Um, that has helped open the door to doing outreach with families and, and doing, you know, education in that way. Um, when there were um, several young people who died by suicide a couple of years ago, there were some very formal postvention resources made available. Kahoot staff were present at all of those to talk about resources and be there to help support and process with families. Um, we have regular presence in local media, both print, television, and radio. Um, we, you know, try to find a lot of different ways to engage in collective impact. So partnering with other service partners in our community to um, you know, address street medicine issues, for instance, that was a recent initiative of ours. Um, additionally, the Cahoots vans themselves are essentially a giant billboard for Wiper Clinic. It's got our logo on it. It's got a phone number you can call um, and folks really recognize this out in the community. Um, for the last four years in a row, uh, the Cahoots program has been voted um, best uh, best service for the homeless in our community by a major local publication. Um, so there's there's a lot of recognition that that we appreciate, but it also takes a lot of work to really be out there uh, informing people of what we do and also just challenging um, conceptions around you know mental health, substance use, and poverty. Thank you for that. Um, do you allow delegates from other areas? There is a lot of interest in the Ithaca area in the CAHOOTS program. Do you allow people to come and do say ride-alongs or even to just you know, see CAHOOTS in action? Yeah, um, if there wasn't a pandemic, absolutely. We'd be hosting <laughs> site visits all, all, all week, every week. Um, yes, historically we have done that. Um, the, the folks from Denver um, who were instrumental in setting up the STAR program um, sent 10 people from Denver, which included state elected officials, um, police command, dispatch staff, social service providers. They did ride-alongs with the teams uh, here in Eugene and Springfield. And we had big meetings to really kind of talk about the service and how, how it would work in, in Denver. So um, as, as more folks are getting vaccinated, as travel becomes safer, we will certainly be opening our doors and um, you know offering up seatbelts. Great, yeah. great. Um, let me see. Oh, uh, two more questions. Uh, one is, are there smaller communities like ours uh, that um, you have an example of that have implemented programs like yours? Olympia, Washington is smaller than um, the city of Eugene. Um, I don't have the, the figure off the top of my head, but as both in terms of available resources and overall population size, uh, Olympia is a lot smaller. Um, if we look at just each individual city um, with our primary service district here for Cahoots, city of Eugene is 135, no, excuse me, uh, 160,000 folks. Springfield is about 60,000. Um, and so that means that, you know, just as a standalone entity, it's the city of Springfield the population of 60,000 still has enough stuff going on that, that really justifies the need for a 24 hour response. Mm -hmm. um, in our work with more rural communities here in Oregon, uh, we've seen that um, there's some potential to at least start by providing additional crisis training for um, you know, current first responders. And that in smaller communities where there might be a volunteer fire department, um, where there's more community paramedicine happening, um, those are communities that are going to be able to most rapidly add crisis response to their services. And finally, could you talk a little bit about how you work with your local NAMI um, and, you know, just and how you communicate with them, what mm -hmm. they're able to, um, to do in cooperation with you, uh, how they um, incorporate the mm -hmm. great service that you're providing uh, with uh, providing advocacy and education for yeah. Or families? Um, we, we help each other with fundraising. Um, so letters of support from CAHOOTS to our local NAMI, vice versa, um, are, are really helpful. Um, when our local NAMI does some sort of community event, um, if there's an opportunity for us to pull one of the CAHOOTS vans out of service, we'll bring it to that, um, that picnic at the park. Um, and 
create an opportunity for folks to get to know the van um, before a crisis emerges, get to see what it's like to sit in the back, look and see what's in our cabinets, um, get an understanding, meet, meet a couple of the responders so that um, if they do need to call us in the future, say, okay, I know this is what the van looks like. You know, I know that this is what it feels like to sit in the back. Uh, I know that they have granola bars and water, you know, water bottles. Um, it helps create that familiarity, right? And then that, that means that there's more comfortability with accessing the service. Um, we speak alongside representatives from NAMI at various uh, opportunities, you know, here locally, we've paneled regionally uh, with, with NAMI affiliates. Um, and then when it comes to our actual work and responding to calls, there've been plenty of times where I've called NAMI Lane County and said, hey, I'm out with the family right now. Um, and they're just feeling too overwhelmed to, answer, you know, to call you on the phone. So I'm here to help be that conduit for them. Here's what's going on. What do you think? You know, um, we do a lot of referrals to other NAMI resources. Um, they, yeah, they're just, they're just incredible. Um, we do joint trainings um, where, uh, you know, NAMI will host and facilitate. And so, and they will talk about trauma and then we'll come in and talk about de-escalation, you know? So there's, there's a lot of joint education opportunities. And um, I would, I would definitely say that they're one of our um, most celebrated partners in our work out in the community. That's great. Thank you so much. It's really good to hear that. Um, Tim, are there any comments that you want to make to close this evening before you leave with us? Yeah, the last thing that I, I really want to emphasize is that, you know, I've spent, you know, what, over an hour and a half now kind of jabbering about what we do here in Oregon. Um, every time we have one of these conversations, I really like to end it by reinforcing that um, for every hour that you spend talking to someone like me about what we're doing here in Oregon or another community, you need to be spending five or 10 hours really listening to uh, your, your, you know, your immediate community, right? Um, as, as we have these conversations with other cities about building programs based on the CAHOOTS model, the first question is, what are you hearing from folks in your community around what this service needs to look like? And if they don't have an answer to that, then they're not ready to really engage with us yet. You know, we, we really need to make sure that the consumers, um, you know, the peers, the, the folks who are going to be using the service and relying on it, um, who are going to be most positively impacted by the reduced potential for police encounters, have a say in, in what this program looks like. So really um, out of the gate, make sure that you got a table big enough for everybody to have a seat, you know, and, and, and really do whatever is needed to lift up the voices that need to be heard the most. Thank you. Our, our community, Tompkins County did undergo the sequential mapping process mm -hmm. um, in 2019, I believe. And there is a lot of guidance in there about the gaps that we have, about the ways that we're meeting the needs and also the goals kind of in order of, um, of how we wish to proceed. Mm -hmm. So I'm hoping that we're looking at that in this process and uh, kind of taking cues from that. Um, I just want to thank you so much for being with us. This has been really terrific. And um, I just want to let everyone know that you have made your slides available so mm -hmm. we can share those. And, um, and this is being recorded. So you'll be able to find that on the NAMI YouTube channel soon. And um, thank you. Thank you so much. This thank has been you. Terrific. Yeah. And, and thank you all for, um, yeah, like I said, taking your Tuesday evening to, um, to, spend some time hearing and thinking about this idea. So I'm, I'm excited to find out what other work there is for us in the future. Great. And I'm going to save the chat just in case there are some questions that we didn't get to. Mm -hmm. um, and I might send those to you if you, if you're please willing to, to answer Absolutely. them. Yeah, okay, do. terrific. Well, thank you everybody for joining us tonight. Uh, this has been a really great event. I hope it's been very informative for everyone. And uh, we wish you all a, a safe and peaceful evening. Take care.